Tuesday, guys. It's May 12th, and we're going to start my favorite part of the year, which is just for the last couple weeks. We're going to do a book called Pilgrim's Progress, so we're going to dive into the introduction of that today. Let's start with a prayer, and here we go. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Dear Lord, we come before you today and ask that you will help us focus our minds and get to our work and um, help us to enjoy our work today. Lord, please help us to use what we learn to bless others. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, here is our path that we're going to take. We're going to go on this journey. It's called Pilgrim's Progress. And our character is going to start right here and travel all the way here. His goal is to make it to the celestial city. So we're going to actually start on that journey tomorrow. Today we're going to learn about the author. Um, first, let's practice our verse. It's John 1, It's a new one. Here it is. Ooh, that was quick. Let's do it again. Here it is. It's pretty quick. Here we go. Today's objectives are to identify key facts about John Bunyan, who is the author of Pilgrim's Progress. This is the, what the, our book looks like, um, our text. Here is Christian. He's the main character, and all these guys are characters in the book, too. All right, um, I'm going to read this to you. It says, The Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come. Oh, hold on. Oh, I thought that was Layla crying, but it wasn't. Okay. The Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come is a 1678 Christian allegory written by John Bunyan. Guys, an allegory is when you can connect an idea and there's a parallel between an idea and a book and real life. So, for example, in Narnia, the Chronicles of Narnia, especially Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, you're probably familiar with that. The lion, Aslan, represents... Jesus. So that's an allegory because it connects and it's a parallel to real life. Well, this story is also an allegory and it's actually now just called The Pilgrim's Progress. It says it is regarded as one of the most significant works of religious theological fiction in English literature. It's been translated into more than 200 languages and has never been out of print. It has also been cited as the first novel written in English. Bunyan began his work while in the Bedfordshire County Prison for violations of the Conventicle Act of 1664, which prohibited the holding of religious services outside the auspices of the established Church of England. So in other words, if you didn't have a service that um, fell under the Church of England or, or agreed with their teaching, and that was like the country's church, if you had a different sort of religion, um, like if you were Lutheran or Baptist or any other religion or sect, then you could be arrested. And so John Bunyan went to jail. We're going to learn more about that um, for violating that. And that's where he wrote his book. Uh, the next slide, let me just zoom out here for a second. Um, he, you're going to need to know about this for your exit ticket. So this first slide is called John Bunyan's Beginning. I'm just waiting for my computer to load. All right, here we go. Bunyan was born in 1628 in the heart of England, a mile south of Bedford, a few years before the English Civil War. His family was so poor that when his father died, John was left only one shilling and his tinker's anvil. So his dad only left him one piece of money, the shilling, that was a coin, and his tinker's anvil. So you might recognize in on cartoons, they drop anvils all the time on characters. It's like this giant um, metal piece of stone, not metal, sorry, this big stone. And you would um, use it to create different pieces of metal or to shape metal. If you put metal in a fire, um, you could shape horseshoes on it or any sort of metal. The boy had little formal education. However, he learned to read and feasted on medieval romances in which valiant knights underwent great trials and conquered villains and monsters. In youth, he boasted a mouth so profane it shocked even wicked men. Yikes, he had a foul mouth. Additionally, he loved to dance, bell ring, 
and lead Sunday sports, all considered improper by Puritans. That's a group of religious people. Although he attended church, he had little religious feeling. Interesting. So he wasn't a very good kid, and he even did things he wasn't supposed to do, like lots of cussing, lots of um, things on Sunday. He had the sports teams he was in charge of, and you weren't really allowed to do that either. This is a little funny cartoon. It says, all right, who's the ringleader? The ringleader, as you probably know, is like the person who gets the trouble going, like the ringleader of a certain situation. And this is a joke because they're all ringing the bell, right? But he loved bell ringing, it said, and that's the activity or pastime of ringing church bells or handbells. Interesting. John turned 16 in 1644 at the height of the Civil War. That's the British Civil War, not our Civil War. He joined the army. Since Bedford was a parliamentarian stronghold, it's probable he served Cromwell. Cromwell's a famous British officer. While on duty, he was drawn out to take part in a siege. Another soldier asked to take his place. As he stood sentinel, he was shot in the head with a musket bullet and died. Yikes, so he was on duty to a siege is when you take over another group of people and they can't get out of where they are and usually you like starve them to death like because they're stuck in wherever whatever place they are and they're surrounded and they can't get out and then they end up dying or you go on an attack and it said another soldier said could I just switch with you for a minute and when he switched with that soldier the other soldier died from a bullet. It says John came to see this as proof God had spared his life for a great work. Not sure why my computer is acting so weird. Thanks for sticking with me here. Here's Oliver Cromwell just to give you an idea of who he is. He was an English military and political leader. He served as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, next page. Returning home, John married. He was 20. His wife was as poor as he. Between them, they didn't have a dish or a spoon. Her godly father had furnished her with two Christian books, books with John, which John read with an increasingly troubled conscience. One Sunday, as he played, he heard a voice. Will you leave your sins and go to heaven, or have, you, or have your sins and go to hell? His distress was acute. That means it was great. He felt that he had sinned so gravely he was beyond forgiveness. Nonetheless, he struggled to find peace with God by obeying spiritual commands, scriptural commands. Outwardly, he reformed and put off swearing in improper sports. Inwardly, he still longed to participate. He read the Bible, although without peace, he, come on, computer, thought God must be pleased with him. Okay, so he obeyed because he was like, if I follow God and do good things, God will love me. But he still was like troubled inside his heart. One day he overheard four women speaking of their inner religious experience and he realized he lacked something. Leaving the Church of England, he joined their fellowship. Still, he lacked peace. Only after reading Luther's commentary on Galatians did he realize he could be justified by faith alone. His inner struggles were not over, but he found relief. Bunyan felt compelled to tell others of faith in Christ. He became a field preacher. So effective were his words, people would arrive at dawn to hear him preach at noon. Wow, they got to church early. Church of England is the established Church of England. Um, it says this is when preaching was a crime. Open-air preaching was illegal. Officials feared that demagogues would incite revolution. For this reason, John was careful never to side with any political faction in his teaching. So he didn't get political when he spoke. He just talked about the Bible. But it was illegal, actually, to preach in the open air or, like, outside or in people's homes. You had to be part of the Church of England at the time it was illegal. It says, all the same, he was in danger. Warned that he was to be arrested if he held church at a friend's house, he went anyway, determined to set an example of boldness. If he fled, weaker brethren would see it and run also. He was seized. Without a hearing or witnesses, the judge sentenced John to three months in prison. Bedford's prison conditions were not the worst in England, yet they were a genuine hardship. There was little light and no bathing facilities. The place stank of unwashed bodies. Prison fever or typhus 
killed many. Oops, killed many prisoners. The cells were overcrowded. John's ration was one quarter loaf of bread a day. Worst of all, he was separated from his family. His first wife had died and he had remarried. He was not home to care for his children, including his blind daughter, Mary, whom he dearly loved. To support them, Bunyan made thousands of long, tagged shoelaces, which he sold. Church members helped the Bunyans, too. At the end of three months, John was offered freedom on condition he would no longer preach. Again, he refused. The months turned to years. All in all, he spent 12 years in prison. Fortunately, a sympathetic jailer let John secretly slip off to meetings. He knew John would always return. Once he even let John go to London, but when his job was threatened, he forbade him to, to so much as peek out the jail anymore, the jail door anymore. For political reasons, Charles II released a number of prisoners, but Bunyan was not among them. He was told he would have to apply for a pardon. He refused. To do so would be to admit he had done wrong. Elizabeth, his wife, pleaded for his release, but sympathetic court officers said John could go free only if he complied with the authorities. So John remained in prison. He was cheerful, believing he suffered for Christ. He had true freedom, he said. In prison, he could read the Bible, preach, and sing hymns with no one to stop him. He was also allowed to write. While in prison, he completed many of his 60 books, including his best known, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners and The Pilgrim's Progress. Released, Bunyan immediately returned to preaching. By now, the authorities re realized he was concerned only with the kingdom of God. They jailed him again for six months in 1675, but otherwise he remained free until he died at 60 years of age, having written The Pilgrim's Progress, the world's most widely circulated book next to the Bible. Wow. Um, one more set of in pieces of information. This page right here is the table of contents. We're about to dive in. Starting tomorrow, we'll read chapters one and two. Um, and just so you have an idea of where we're headed, there are 13 chapters in this book. We're going to read the introduction right now, which tells us just a little bit more about John Bunyan. Every day, I'm also going to give you the glossary, which gives you terms you'll need to know for each chapter. We're not going to do that for the introduction. Here's the introduction. Um, it is starting here with about this book. John Bunyan wrote his beloved classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, in two parts. The first published in London in 1678 and the second part in 1684. He originally titled it The Pilgrim's Progress from This World to That Which is to Come. This book is a young reader's adaptation of the first part of Bunyan's book. So guys, there's actually um, an adult version, but it's a lot more complex and it is um, written... In Old English, you can buy more modern versions, but this is one more on a fifth grade level. This version is designed to capture children's imaginations and introduce them to Bunyan's enduring masterpiece. The story will captivate them as they follow Christian on his adventurous journey, as well as teach them great biblical truths they can hold on to as they grow in faith. Some of the scenes have been condensed, and the language has been rewritten, rewritten to appeal to children. But the essence of the story is the same. One Christian's Walk of Faith to the Glorious Goal. I'm going to skip over here. Um, and here's the introduction using John Bunyan. A long, long time ago, a prisoner sat in a cold jail in England. That's John Bunyan. In his cell, he had a Bible, a pen, and some paper. Over many months, he wrote an adventure story that, in many ways, was like his own life. The man's name was John Bunyan, and his story became a famous book called The Pilgrim's Progress. John was born in 1628 to a poor family in Bedford, England. When he was old enough, he learned to read and write in the village school, but soon he had to leave school to help his family. He became a tinker like his dad. A tinker is a person who mends pots and pans. Guys, I just want to make sure that's it. I'm just wondering if I left something off, so... Um... Oh yeah, I did. Yes, Lele! Okay, so the last last two pages. Even though his family didn't have much, John's early years were happy. From time to time, though, he had very bad dreams and nightmares. When John was older, he joined the army and fought a war for England. After the war, John got married to a woman named Margaret. They had four children, but John was troubled. He had a hard time believing in God. 
His wife told him about God's love and forgiveness. John came to trust in the Savior and have peace in his heart. After he put his faith in Christ, he joined a church in his hometown of Bedford. However, it wasn't the official state church called the Church of England. During this time, John discovered he had a gift for preaching God's word. John's wife died at a young age, and a few years later, he married a second wife, Elizabeth. By this time, he had become a popular preacher. But since John didn't belong to the Church of England, he was arrested and put in jail for preaching. Just a second, Lily. Elizabeth was a brave Christian. She tried all she could to get John out of prison, but he had to remain there for 12 years. After he was let go, he went back to the church in Bedford and continued preaching. He also helped start many other churches, but in a few years he was again arrested and sent to jail. This time he was freed in just a few months. In 1688, John traveled to London. On the way home, he got very sick. He stayed at a friend's house hoping to get better, but died several days later. His family and friends took him to Bunhill Fields in London to bury him. John will always be best remembered for his story, The Pilgrim's Progress. In the hundreds of years since John wrote it, many people all over the world have read and treasured it. It's been translated into over 200 languages. The Bible is the only book that has ever sold more copies. The Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory. An allegory is a story with two meanings. First, this is an exciting adventure story of a man and his friends on a journey to a wonderful place. On their way, they meet many challenges, dangers, and enemies. But it's also a story that teaches important truths about Jesus and every Christian's journey through life. Now turn the pages. The Pilgrim's Progress has been rewritten especially for you to understand and enjoy. All right, guys, all you need to do now is complete your exit ticket which it looks like this, and there are some multiple choice questions at the end um, based on today's lesson video. Have a great day, Lele. Do you want to say bye? Say bye. Say bye. 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 Oh, okay. She just woke up from a nap, so she's not going to say bye right now. All right, guys. Love you. Miss you. Bye.